Everyone was supposed to come up with five new ideas for animated features. And I went out and looked for ideas, and I went into a bookstore, and I read The Little Mermaid, and got very excited about it. Welcome to Ms. Mojo, and today we're discussing The Little Mermaid, from fairy tale to film. Come in, my child. We mustn't lurk in doorways. It's rude. For this video, we'll be looking at how Hans Christian Andersen's 1837 story evolved into a Disney treasure reflecting the titular mermaid's transformative voyage from sea to land. Chapter 1, Treasures Untold Premiering in 1989, The Little Mermaid ushered in a new golden age of animated Disney classics. I'm really looking forward to this performance, Sebastian. Oh, your majesty! This will be the finest concert I have ever conducted. Your daughters, they will be spectacular! This wasn't the first time that the studio considered an adaptation of the fairy tale, however. Between the late 30s and early 40s, Disney nearly collaborated with producer Samuel Goldwyn on a package film entitled The Life of Hans Christian Andersen. Would you like me to tell you a special story? You would? Well, come on up here. Similar to Song of the South, the author's life would have been depicted in live action while animation would be utilized to bring several of his stories to fruition. Danish illustrator Kai Nielsen, who worked on the finale of Fantasia and the 1924 publication Fairy Tales by Hans Andersen, conceived gothic concept art for Disney's proposed Little Mermaid segment. The project was always on shaky footing, though. Look at her! On legs! On human legs! <laughs> Between story issues, World War II, and the Disney animator strike, the production sank by the 1940s. Goldwyn would produce a 1952 Hans Christian Andersen movie, albeit without animation. But we all believe it's a king, don't we? Yes. And since we have no clothes for the king, this will have to be a story about a king who had no clothes. Over the decades, the Disney studio revisited several Andersen stories that had been considered for the package film, including The Steadfast Tin Soldier, The Snow Queen, and The Little Mermaid. After Jeffrey Katzenberg approved Ron Clements' pitch for a Little Mermaid animated feature in the mid-80s, Nielsen's concept art and story material was uncovered from the Disney archives. And, and it was better in the writing than it was in the telling. The question was, what do you do with it next? In the world in which I come from, go hire a great screenwriter. So I guess he was checking out other writers, people were sending in drafts and everything, and uh, Ron Clements finally came to him and said, I think we can do a good job on this. By chance, some of Disney's original ideas for a Little Mermaid adaptation lined up with Clemens's two-page treatment. While not without their differences, both deviated significantly from Anderson's fairy tale, which is far darker than some may realize. Can you do that? Chapter 2, From Fins to Feet In the source material and the 1989 film, The Little Mermaid has several older sisters and a widowed Sea King father. There's also a prince who catches the mermaid's eye, and a sea witch who grants her legs at a price. But I don't have it. I'm not asking much. Just a token, really, a trifle. You'll never even miss it. None of these characters had actual names in Anderson's fairy tale. Ariel was simply the little mermaid, Ursula was just the sea witch, and so on. Also missing were supporting players like Sebastian, Flounder, and Scuttle. Jeez, Mum, I'm surrounded by amateurs. You want something done, you've got to do it yourself. Where 16-year-old Ariel is forbidden from going to the surface world, Anderson's mermaid is allowed to get a glimpse of the human world upon turning 15. Going above water, the mermaid falls in love with a prince, who she rescues from a violent sea storm on his birthday. I can't make out a heartbeat. No, look! He's breathing. He's so beautiful. Clements and co-director John Musker were inspired by Nielsen's sea storm art while developing their version. In Anderson's fairy tale, the prince has no memory of the mermaid after she leaves his unconscious body by a temple. We just want to forget this whole thing ever happened. The sea king will never know. You won't tell him, I won't tell him. I will stay in one piece. For the unmade version, Walt Disney suggested that the prince should briefly see the mermaid and hear her sing to him. Coincidentally, the 1989 film included a similar first encounter between Ariel and Eric. A girl rescued me. She, she was singing. She had the most beautiful voice. 
While Anderson's mermaid is drawn to the prince, that's not her sole motivation for wanting to be human. The mermaid's grandmother, who's absent from the 1989 film, tells her that humans don't live as long as mermaids. However, humans possess souls that live on in the afterlife, while mermaids turn to sea foam after dying. She was intrigued by the human world and particularly by this prince, but also she aspired to have an immortal soul. Clemens and Musker dropped the immortality angle, feeling Ariel's love for Eric and the human world would be enough. In both versions, the mermaid visits a sea witch who makes her a potion that'll turn her human. That's what I do. It's what I live for, to help unfortunate merfolk like yourself. There are several differences, though. Unlike Ursula, Anderson's sea witch doesn't have an alternative motive to overthrow the Sea King. She's morally ambiguous rather than a straight-up villain. Ursula's potion also comes with very specific conditions, like a strict three-day window. If he does kiss you before the sun sets on the third day, you'll remain human permanently. But if he doesn't, you turn back into a mermaid and you belong to me. Anderson's version lacks a three-day deadline, although the mermaid has to get the prince to fall in love with and marry her to receive a soul. If the prince marries someone else, the mermaid will turn to sea foam and perish. Life's full of tough choices, isn't it? Anderson's mermaid doesn't just sacrifice her voice to the witch, she loses her tongue. Obviously, Disney didn't go that extreme. Walking on legs is also a much more painful adjustment for Anderson's mermaid, who feels like she's being stabbed with each step. Although she can't talk, the mermaid grows close to the prince, who's still determined to marry the girl who rescued him. Far better than any dream girl is one of flesh and blood, one warm and caring and right before your eyes. Eric is similarly resolute, but he gives up pursuing his mystery girl in favor of Ariel, not realizing they're one and the same. Using a human disguise, Ursula hypnotizes Eric into marrying her. The wedding is stopped, Ursula is defeated, Ariel becomes human, and they all live happily ever after. It, it was you all the time! Oh, Eric, I, I wanted to tell you… This is where Disney pretty much jumped ship from the source material. In Anderson's story, the prince believes that the girl who rescued him at the temple is also the princess that he's arranged to marry. The prince thus marries the princess, never learning who the mermaid truly is. Do you, Eric, take Vanessa to be your lawfully wedded wife for as long as you both shall live? I do. The mermaid's sisters strike another bargain with the sea witch, giving up their hair for a dagger. By murdering the prince and dousing her feet in his blood, she can become a mermaid again. Unable to go through with the act, the mermaid throws the dagger and herself overboard, turning into sea foam. While not the happiest ending, the mermaid's actions allow her to become an earthly spirit. If she spends the next three centuries doing good deeds, she'll be rewarded with a soul and ascend to heaven. Chapter 3 A New Voice when uh, Hans Christian Andersen wrote The Little Mermaid, he was 32 years old and he had two love experiences, but unhappy love experiences. The Little Mermaid mirrors Andersen's life in many respects. Andersen wanted to be an opera singer, but his voice wasn't strong enough. He felt like a fish out of water in society, especially when it came to his love life. In contrast to his splendid career as an author, there is this tragic life of a person who could not get the love and had to spend his life in loneliness. Given Anderson's lifetime of unrequited love, it's not surprising that he ended The Little Mermaid on such a heartbreaking note. Disney isn't the first studio to give the fairy tale a happier ending. In a 1958 Shirley Temple version, Neptune allows the mermaid to live on with her family, although she still doesn't get her prince. Even in the unmade Disney version, Walt felt that the prince shouldn't end up with the mermaid, who's given a tragic end. The actual Disney version explored in the 40s was even sadder 
than the Anderson's version because um, she totally died and turned into sea foam and she was gone. Of course, Walt also said, quote, We don't need to do Anderson literally. As tonally different as they are, Anderson's fairy tale and the 1989 film are both about passionate heroines who go after what they want. Bright young women, sick of swimming, ready to stand. Where one is more of a cautionary tale, the other encourages its audience to pursue their dreams. At the same time, both versions delve into the sacrifices people make to achieve those dreams. Although Ariel becomes human, she still must say goodbye to her family and friends. Then I guess there's just one problem left. And what's that, Your Majesty? How much I'm going to miss her. The father-daughter theme wasn't prevalent in Anderson's story, but it provides one of the film's most emotional arcs as Ariel and Triton part ways. In that sense, the Disney version preserves one of the fairy tale's key themes while taking another route. There's still a price to be paid. Uh, uh, the king has to give up his daughter and, and Ariel has to give up her family. So there is a bittersweet aspect and, and I think in that respect, hopefully it would be something that Hans Christian Andersen could relate to. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. If you want a Disney adaptation of an Anderson fairy tale that goes all the way with a bleak ending, we'd recommend Roger Allers' beautiful take on The Little Match Girl. However, a movie doesn't necessarily need to be a faithful adaptation to be a good adaptation. What do they got? A lot of sand. We got a hot For many, the 1989 film is the definitive Little Mermaid. This is largely thanks to the original aspects that Disney brought to the story, from Alan Menken and Howard Ashman's Oscar-winning music, to the fleshed-out characters, to the heartfelt resolution that perhaps resonated more with parents than with their children. I love you, Daddy. Sometimes the best adaptations are the ones that strive to be different. And in a story about a mermaid becoming human, changes are only appropriate. agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from Ms. Mojo. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.